All right. All right, here we go. Tom Dolan, welcome to the podcast, mate. How you doing? I'm great, Brett. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah, I appreciate it. I was I was talking to Lenny Kraselberg yesterday, actually, one of your old teammates yeah. um, on the 2000 team. And I, and I said, look, I don't know much about Tom, but I just know of him and I've seen him swim and know his reputation. I was like, how will he be on the podcast? He's like, man, he'll be amazing. He's got great <laughs> stories. That'll be so good. I can't wait to listen. So he's, he's excited about it. That's awesome. Lenny's... Uh... He's one of my uh, my very good buds uh, from from all our national teams, and you, I mean, you know how it is. It doesn't matter what country. Um, there's a there's a unique special bond, uh, yeah. you know. I think that that you have with with all of your teammates um, yeah. when you get to an international level like that. But uh, Lenny and I room together for a lot of our national team trips, and uh, he, oh. he's a he's a really good friend, and and uh, he's it's funny, you know. Back in the day, he was kind of the <clears throat> the even keel emotional guy and i was the raw rob pep mm -hmm. guy so mm -hmm. we were a good combo together so it's yeah. uh it's good to hear he's a good man yeah no doubt yeah lenny is a good man i, I want to get into that kind of rah, rah, rah a little bit because i i have i have a, a story but i'll bring it up later but um mm -hmm. i, I want to get into it but in terms of um just i can't remember a time before the internet really you know I, I, but i know <laughs> that you know you and i start you know grew up kind of around the same era and um and, and uh, you know, around the same time. And I, actually, the research I was doing today, I just discovered that I'm actually three months older than you. So Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, it's pretty cool. But, you know, when I was back in Australia around 90, 92, 93, 94, 95, you know, 96, watching the Olympics, you know, we didn't have the internet. So we just, I don't know how we heard things, but I just remember hearing about Tom Dolan. I remember hearing about this superstar swimmer that the U.S. had, and then finally getting to watch you at the 96 Olympics and just, it was, it was just incredible. So, but like for you, you know, how did you kind of get into swimming? Um, wh where did it all start for you? Yeah. So, um, I, when I started swimming, it was pretty simple. My sister is, I have one sibling, I have an older sister who's three years older and I was the annoying little brother that just wanted to beat her in everything. I mean, she could have done any sport, any activity, and I would have, that was my thing then until I beat her. And then I would decide like, okay, is this what I want to do? So that's, I mean, honestly, that's how I got into swimming. Um, you know, I grew up in Northern Virginia and, and um, kind of in the DC area. My story is, is pretty, pretty typical, I would say for, um, for people that eventually choose the swimming pathway. And that is that my entry point was a summer swim team, um, just a neighborhood pool that, you know, kind of all the kids, you know, in that neighborhood joined. Um, and what I loved about it is it's one of those unique experiences where it introduces a sport in a really social way. Mm. Um, and it's, it's really kind of as a, as a little guy, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years old, um, all you really know is that there's just a ton of kids and truth be told, not a lot of technique, um, but you're just kind of having fun in the pool. And, if nothing else, I think it's fantastic as a entry point because it shows you the team side of swimming, which as you and I both know from a collegiate level and international level, it's easier to see it when you're there. Mm -hmm. But it's hard when you're little to kind of understand, like, is this an individual sport or a team sport? And um, how much of an impact um, and a positive um, catalyst teammates can provide for your performance and overall enjoyment level of the sport. And I think it's, in our area, it's so cool that that's what every young swimmer gets to experience first. Um, and so that was kind of my entry point into it. The other thing that happened for me is um, I am uh, kind of, um, how would I say it? I am over the top competitive to the point where it's not that great in normal everyday life, how competitive I am. Like, I fully admit to my wife that it is a... It is as much a hindrance as it is a help. Um, and I was kind of born that way. I mean, I think even as a little kid, I just thrived off of the let's line it up and go. Um, and that's really my earliest memory of summer swimming is that I loved being part of this huge, crazy, kind of chaotic, somewhat disorganized thing that everybody cheered and you had these, te every team had their different cheers for different races. And, um, but then I also love the fact that you could get in. And I remember even at seven, eight years old, I just loved that lane mentality that 
<clears throat> I can only control what's in my lane. I can't control what the other swimmers are doing, but I can control the outcome, right? In other words, I can make sure I win. And that was one of my earliest memories of youth sports and, and, and kind of ultimately for me, um, what led me to swimming was that, that kind of simplistic to a way philosophy. And, and the, the thing about it though, I think is, is, is I remember back, I loved, and, and, and one of the things about my kind of entry point into the swimming was that it was gradual. It wasn't just this, like, this is the thing I'm going to do. Um, I played a ton of different sports and to this day, certainly even at the Olympics, I would think about how thankful um, I was and am to this day that I had those experiences of playing soccer and playing baseball and playing basketball and playing golf and tennis and trying mm -hmm. team sports versus individual sports. And, um, you know, the, the, one of the greatest um, kind of pieces of advice, but at the time it was a rule um, in, in, in my household that my sister and I had um, what, and one of the greatest kind of, I would say it, pieces of, of, or kind of impact on my swimming career was my mom and dad sat my sister and I down and said, um, you guys have to do two activities. It doesn't have to be two sports. It could be playing an instrument and doing a sport, but two activities every season. Mm. You can't just do one until ninth grade, until our freshman year in high school. And at that point, if we wanted to just do one, we could. We didn't have to. We could do two through high school. Like I played golf through high school with swimming because it was just a fall sport. Um, but it was – I didn't realize at the time, and I think every year that went by, I appreciated it more and more, um, how that balanced my life out. And, you know, I think that the reality of kind of starting, and I started early in swimming. It's not like I waited until I was 12 or 13. Like, I started on the summer team as like a little dolphin or whatever they called us at five years old. Um, but I never just did that. Um, you know, it was always, sure, I'd go to swim practice maybe in the morning, um, but then I would play baseball in the afternoon or I would play uh, basketball or golf or like I always did something mm. else mm. so that like I think from a mindset standpoint even as a even as a as a little guy you know up till say 12 years old maybe even 13 years old um, I never really viewed myself as a swimmer it just was something I did along with all these other activities if anything I just viewed myself as someone that hated 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 more than anything in the world to lose yeah. And that was my fuel. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I got started. And truth be told, I don't even really think I, I knew strokes and tech. I just raced. Mm -hmm. I just knew how to race and get to the other side. Yeah, well, you and I have some parallels when it comes to that and the way we grew up. You know, I played multiple sports too. My, my family was, had a very similar philosophy. Um, but the other thing that we have in common too is, is our asthma. I had, I had asthma for, from, a, you know, from a kid, from basically from the day I was born. Uh, I was in and out of hospital the first six years of my life. Wow. And, and I really didn't know any different. And it wasn't until you know, the age of 10 or 11 where doctors were like, look, you know, he's healthy enough to start some real constant activity, get him into swimming to strengthen his, his lungs. And, and yep. swimming was the gateway to kind of my, my overall health then. Um, wh how was, when did the asthma come on for you and how did that impact you at an early age? Yeah, it's interesting. So my, um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd say it has the greatest impact on my swimming career of anything mm. by, by a long shot. Mm. Um, and, a, and in a lot of ways for, for negative reasons, as you experience, but ultimately for the most positive probably reason, which I'll get to in a second. But so I was kind of, um, I was, I was what now is, is more of unusual kind of unique circumstances. I wasn't born with it. I was born with really bad allergies, um, but to my knowledge, at least today, they certainly didn't diagnose it when I was little. I didn't mm. get diagnosed with asthma until I was 12. Okay. Um, and, I, and I vividly remember I was just, it wasn't swimming, I was running outside at recess in the winter, um, like in the back parking lot of my school, and I, I felt this really kind of, you know, a tightness in the chest, but this kind of strange coppery taste in the back of my mouth. Um, and just felt that overall restriction of this is more than just I have a cold or I'm not feeling, you know, and, and I think at the time I then realized I had had it for a while and didn't say anything. I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't, you know, I just didn't know how to describe it. Um, and that's the point when they diagnosed me with asthma and mine was 
was a problem because it was environmental based. So it was still based on seasonal change and allergies that triggered my asthma, like pollen in the spring, leaf mold when the leaves come down in the fall, dust in general. Um, you know, I had to claim 12 years old. The first marching order my doctor gave me was take all the trophies and stuffed animals, everything out of my room, nothing on the shelves, mm -hmm. just bare walls. Yeah. Um, and my sister would make fun of me and say, like, I'm living like a monk. I just had four white walls. And, <laughs> um, and that was, but the other side of my asthma was, it was exercise induced. Yeah. So the, the largest percent of, of kind of the trigger um, for my asthma was from exercise. Yeah. So the oddity of balancing it out was that, sure, swimming was good for it in that it increased lung capacity, right? It, it, it built up my energy systems to be able to handle the, the, the reduced oxygen mm. um, as a result of, of, of struggling with asthma. But, but the flip side of that is, so it was building it up right which was a lot of young kids are told to swim because they have asthma for all those reasons yeah the downside of it was i then was kind of doing the thing that was the biggest trigger for it and of and of course i wasn't as talented and didn't have the the the, the fast switch muscle fibers like like you did to do 50 and 100 i did the 4 i am mm. i mean i had the event where i had to train the most yeah. so it's not like i could just have it in short spurts and like it was, so it was a problem training wise and, and it became, so for me, it started off as an issue and became more of an issue as I progressed through swimming rather than having swimming help it more. Um, a lot of which because of the, the fact that it was exercise induced, um, I had some other factors that, that influenced it. Like I still to this day and had it when I was little as well, I had bad acid reflux, mm -hmm. which is essentially the medical term for heartburn. Yeah. A lot of asthmatics have it. Because when you start to have an asthma attack or even have symptoms and triggers come on, it stirs up the acid in your in your stomach and it brings it up and sprays it into the lungs. Yeah. So it does make your breathing worse. And um, so they, sometimes they do go hand in hand. Um, but it, it, it um, I'll, I'll tell you what, though, I, I think that <clears throat> here's here's what what it did for me. And I'm sure you you can relate to this in every way is that. One, it, it forced me to mature so much earlier and faster than I ever would have. And by mature, what I mean is uh, mature within the idea of who am I as an athlete and how am I going to deal with, with obstacles and, um, and, and issues that impact my performance, right? Which is, I would say, a pretty standard reality that as athletes, whether we're swimmers or not, we all deal with that. In, in different ways as a general concept. But I think for asthma, what it did is present every, every day, every minute of every day in front of me, this reality that I can't control everything, right? And so go back for, for a minute and think about, you know, eight-year-old me kind of falling in love with the idea that I can control this little space in this lane. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to worry about these other people because if I do everything I possibly can, I have confidence that I can get my hand on the wall first, right? Mm. And all that comes kind of shattered, gets shattered and comes falling down when asthma comes along to say, sure, you can do everything possible and listen to your doctors and avoid things you're allergic to. But ultimately, you don't, you, you're never going to have full control of your asthma. I mean, even as an Olympian, you don't have full control of your asthma. It, it, it's a reality that's with you every day. You can, you can try to manage it, but you know, it, it still rears its ugly head. I mean, oh, yeah. Perfect example, um, in Perth at, at Worlds in 98, I had an asthma attack in the finals of the Tuner I Am. Mm. was supposed to win the Tuner I Am, had an asthma attack, and I didn't go under. I didn't have to be pulled, but I barely made it to the wall to finish the 200 and had to immediately be, be rushed off and, and treated. And, you know, it's just the, the, the allergens are different in Western Australia than I was used to. I mean, it's a whole bunch of different – same thing would happen – you know, when I first started in Michigan, it's just you have to get adjusted to the environment. And when those are all triggers for your asthma, it's just the reality that you kind of then live with. And, and I think ultimately, my point of it, it forcing me to mature is that I'm a control person, right? I think part of, part of, of the wiring for, for competitive people is they want to control the situation, right? Um, and that's, that's kind of how they leverage their competitiveness to say, I'm going to do everything possible from a training perspective, from preparing my body so that I can control the race, right? Mm -hmm. 
And by doing that, I know I can win and, and, and more importantly, not lose. Right. But ultimately, if you think about it, asthma is kind of a, I don't want to say it's an always lose situation, but you can't control every aspect of it. Mm. And I think it was such a, a, an important life lesson for me to go through at a young age that was really hard to go through and kind of be faced with because I had already had like some level of success. I mean, I was young, but I'd already seen some success in swimming. And I think it just brought this whole other reality of this is just going to be something that you have to manage. And sometimes it's going to be bad. Um, and you're not, and you could have done everything possible that your doctor told you and it's still bad. Yeah. And that's a hard concept for a young kid, I think, to fully grasp and accept. Just doesn't seem like the world should be that way, right? Yeah. Now, you know, we, we know now as, as adults and parents, that is the way the world is, right? But I think that, you know, and also that as athletes, we, we tend to be pretty stubborn, right? We, we don't want to listen to, to people saying no or you can't. Um, and if we do, that fires us up more. And so I think mm-hmm. it was such a life-altering kind of um, – experience to go through that lasted my whole career and one of the things that I always said you know even when when I kind of was able and lucky enough to get to an Olympic level is that it I firmly believe first of all I believe if I didn't have asthma swimming would have been a whole heck of a lot easier Mm -hmm. than it was and I'm sure you would agree with that yeah Um, but the other side of it is I will say the glass half full side of it is I don't think I would have been half of the competitor Mm. Um, and kind of stubborn pain in the butt competitor that I was if I didn't have asthma because to me the the joy of the sport came at the competitions Mm. because that was the icing on the cake it was so hard to get there battling asthma every single day that by the time I got to a competition it wasn't like a oh no like what if it doesn't go it was, it was, that was like kind of the reward, the treat for, for, for enduring all of that, you know, those bumps and, and, and windy roads to get there, which is, which is also why my emotions were the way they were. You know, I think I was a competitor that, that let it all out and released it. And a lot of it is because it was freaking hard for me to get there. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it wasn't hard for others. I can only speak for my pathway. Yeah. And my pathway, I wouldn't wish on anyone mm-hmm. because it was brutal. And I had to go through a lot that some days I would pass out in the water and have to be pulled out. And I had to learn to manage that. And so it changed my pers- perspective, certainly, of, of the sport. But I also think that in a very positive way, it kind of almost wired me differently that I wouldn't have been had I not had to go through that. Yeah. Well, I think there's some lessons here, too, because we, you know, you run a swim school and, I, and I've worked in college before. And we get the question all the time, you know, how do you go from – a 12 year old who's playing multiple sports, who's dealing with asthma. There's a gap for me in your story. And I want it filled in a little bit in terms of how do you go from that to one of the top teams in the country swimming for one of the best coaches in history, John Abanchek. Um, you know, where, what happens in those formative years for you? How do you get from where most normal kids are to being in one of the top colleges in the country. And, and we had talked off, off camera a second ago about a couple of people that had some influence on you and some of the influences you had around you. Just talk to those a little bit about, yeah. you know. Sure. Look, I think the, the first thing I would say is um, my goal always was to be a good athlete, mm. an elite athlete. I never viewed it as it's just swimming and only swimming. So even when I kind of chose the pathway or it chose me however we want to look at it of swimming I still always viewed it as um, we need to be good athletes to be swimmers Mm. and I just think historically through the through the past decades that's not always been the case I think we've made the mistake of um, not having well-rounded athletes become swimmers Mm. Um, and I think it matters right like like I would tell you that um, feel for the water is an athletic endeavor Mm. right and how that how how you feel in your fingertips and and through your hands when you grab water is not something that's just learned because the only thing you ever did was swim right and and i think because it's a process and it doesn't really mean always literally the feel for the water it's the overall idea of do you know your body and how your body moves around and 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 how to find the most efficient way through and so i guess it's important for me to kind of start there because even something like golf, which I loved growing up, 
Um, and, and, and as I mentioned before, I played through high school mm. because it didn't really conflict with my swimming season, but it also balanced me out. I, I'm, a, I'm a very passionate person about whatever I do. And, um, and I think as a result, what I came to learn through my high school years and into college is that I needed to balance life out so that I didn't get totally burned out on one side or the other. Um, yeah. And I think what I learned from exactly those years you're, you're talking about, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, you know, 18 is when I first broke the world record in the 4am at Rome in 94. Um, those are important six years. Um, and there's a couple of things that happened that I think uh, were very impactful ultimately on my swimming career, but also just impactful on my view of the world and life skills and then how I would apply those um, to swimming. Because I also am a firm believer that <clears throat> kind of the way I grew up and how I learned that I could have chosen other sports and been successful. And I don't say that in an egotistical way. I say it in, that's just how I viewed things, mm -hmm. right? I viewed it as whatever I did, excuse me, if, um, if I was passionate about it, I was gonna do everything and anything possible to work the hardest and to outwork everybody in the world. And therefore I just felt like, why, why couldn't I be the best in the world? Like it's unfair if I wouldn't be because I just worked harder than everybody. And that was kind of my mentality was ultimately out of work, the results are already there. You don't have to make the results out of them. You deserve those, right? And I think that's a different mindset, um, you know, that, that maybe not everybody has it wasn't always that way. And so, you know, one of the huge kind of turning points for me was um, still, still playing other sports and participating in other activities, but obviously now at uh, 14, um, you know, really started to see, okay, I'm kind of climbing the ranks in swimming. Um, mm. And I was a breaststroker growing up. So even summer league swimming, breaststroke was my natural stroke. Mm. Um, and so my first junior national cut, believe it or not, was in 200 breaststroke. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I, I remember making junior nationals um, at 14. And the next season, when I had, had just turned 15, um, going to junior nationals again in Buffalo, uh, lovely Buffalo, mm -hmm. I had made juniors in Bangor, Maine, and then gone to Buffalo. My poor parents are like, what sport are we in when we're going to these <laughs> awful places? But anyway... Um, when I when I went to juniors when I was a, a 15 year old, um, I made senior nationals in I think four events. So it was a really quick kind of turn from whoa I made juniors mm. and now all of a sudden I make senior nationals and I made it in uh, the 200 brushstroke, the 500 free, the mile, and the four I am. So that's mm. kind of was my was my base so to speak. So in other words, you know I started grew up as a brushstroker. Um, started to really train distance um, as I got into kind of my junior and high school years um, into, into high school um, and had this combination of, okay, you know, breaststroke, distance background, 4 am would make sense, but hadn't really swum it a lot. I had no idea strategically how to swim it. Um, but more of the point of the story is I, all of a sudden I qualified for seniors in multiple events mm. and I'll never forget being a 15 year old and I was a super skinny kid. I mean, I was a skinny kid even through the Olympics, but, um, <clears throat> and I'll never forget going on the pool deck that we were at, uh, university of Minnesota's pool for seniors is this spring seniors, but winter in Minnesota. Um, mm. and I remember walking around the pool deck and seeing, you know, um, Matt Biondi and Janet Evans and, and Mel Stewart and um, Rock Santos and Sergio Lopez and Mike Berriman and, and that whole kind of era um, of, of swimmers who, you know, we all looked up to. And it's mm. funny, like to your point of how did we look up to them? Because we didn't, we didn't have the internet, but, mm. uh, but I remember, you know, like uh, Swimming World was like one of the few magazines back then. So yeah. it was monthly publications. And that was the only time that you really saw and knew what people were doing in times. But the point is, you know, we'd see him on TV and it was just kind of this like, you know, glow of like, oh, mm. and, and it's funny, I think back now, because that's not who I was, who I became, but I certainly was at that point. And I'll never forget it because I'm not a, I'm not a great, it was never important to me. Like, I don't remember times that well or yeah. splits. Yeah. Um, I remember races. Like, I remember the feel of everything and the emotion of everything. Um, and that's also how I 
how I trained. Like I didn't worry about what other people's times were. I worried about the effort I was putting in. Mm. Um, but at that meet, I, it was like I was an out-of-body experience. Like I, I didn't swim well in any of my events. Um, I was just almost disconnected. Like I, I, it was almost just like I didn't, I didn't understand what I was doing there and how I got there and how all these great Olympians and national team swimmers were there that I looked up to. Um, and now I'm at the same meet, you know, and it's like the classic little, you know, junior swimmer move of like, you're in the warm up pool and you're in the lane, you're going like, oh my God, like, is that Janet Evans in my lane warming up? You know, like I had yeah. those moments. And, but I think it was also awesome because I remember that, right? So I remember then when kids came up to me at meets and it was a big deal to me to stop and talk to them and sign an autograph or just the other, because I remember how you, you can't even process it when you're on the other side of it. Yeah. And, but the point is it was a bad meet. And I never really had a bad meet. And, but it wasn't a bad meet because I missed a turn or I refused to work out. I just, I didn't understand what was happening. And at the time, I totally didn't put the pieces together that I just didn't, I didn't really know what long-term goals meant, right? I didn't really know how to bridge kind of short-term goals. And I just hadn't gone through that. And so I'll never forget, I, I came back from the meet. And at the time, um, one of the pools I was, I was training in was at American University's pool. Mm. And where my story becomes really unique and I feel super fortunate is um, having grown up in the Northern Virginia DC area, there is a, a, a uh, pretty incredible history of mm. high level swimming. Yeah. Um, and so, so at the time this was, let me think about this. So this would have been, uh, as, uh, so I was 15. So this would have been 80, so we were born in 75, so this would have been 91? Nine, right? So Oh, that right? early. No, 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 sorry. 90. 90, yeah, 90. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What am I talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Because it was at, it was before Barcelona. Mm. Yeah, but after right? yeah, before Barcelona, but after Seoul. Because yep. Seoul is when Sergio won bronze in the and tuna rush row. That's right, yeah. And so Sergio trained at American University, went to American University. Mm. Um and the the main reason he went there is Joseph Naji was was a coach there, yeah. And trained Sergio and Mike Berriman and Rock Santos and a, and kind of a whole stable of guys that were all you know brushstrokers. Most of them two hundred brushstrokers. Um, and so I had this kind of aha, like wow, this is around me. Um, and I'll never forget. I came back from that from that senior nationals at Minnesota, and Sergio, who I knew. I knew I didn't know him like super well. I was really young, but um, was so great because he said, "Hey, let's let's walk around campus. Let's go have lunch and walk around campus and just talking about how you feel." And as best as I could express it in my naive fifteen-year-old way of saying, "Yeah, it's it's not like I I hate swimming. I just I don't really know where I'm supposed to go now. Like this all kind of happened in a flurry." And where do I re, how do I reset goals and how do I kind of refocus and understand, you know, what am I choosing? Where am I viewing events? Where am I, right? And, and really it's that classic moment of like, wh what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Right. And um, I'll never forget it. And, and, and I don't see Sergio a ton, but whenever I see him or I'm able to connect with them, um, I always remind him of, of what an impact he had. And, you know, he really was so great because in, in that super positive way that Sergio has of just mm. carrying himself, mm. you know, he kind of just said, look, you're, you're a fun loving guy. That's very competitive. And he could tell even at a young age that the danger for you is you're going to have to balance it out because you could, you could drive yourself nuts because you're so competitive. So make sure you use that fun loving side to balance things out. And, 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 and one of the great takeaways I got from him was, you can't really ever have what is a ultimate long-term goal. It's always got to be reset, right? And so no matter what you achieve or, or, or aim for, there's got to be something behind it, mm. right? And one of the things I really learned from that for myself was the thing behind it was for the passion of the process because it didn't matter then what time I went because I fell in love with the process of getting there so that you could just hit repeat on that. Whether you break a world record or do a best time, you hit repeat because you're falling in love with the process, not the thing at the end, whether it's the shiny metal or the time. And that's hard for a 15 year old to kind of grasp, right? So by no means am I saying, I totally understood that at that time, 
but ultimately that's kind of what I leveraged and, mm -hmm. and used. And so it's just, it, it is that turning point in my swimming career. And I didn't, I didn't, in truth at the time I said, okay. And I was able to get back in. Right. Yeah. So I could get back in the water, start training again and kind of then go from, from that point, um, you know, ultimately back to your question of kind of getting through those ranks of putting pieces together. So mm. from a training standpoint, taking that breaststroke background, um, pairing it with a distance swimming training base and starting to work through um, how a 4 I am should be put together, the strategy mm. of it and um, how much energy uh, to, to use on butterfly. It's not my best stroke, right? And backstroke at the time was a really weak stroke for me. And so how to kind of... Uh, improve on that to piece it together for a back half that was my strength um and and really had to strategize that and and race it in a way that isn't just guns blaring um so that you're just blowing energy systems out before the race is even close to being over and kind of you know i think before i am it takes kind of like the decathlon it takes years to get those you've got to get some experiences under your belt of, of really racing it and figuring out how to put those pieces of puzzle together. And I think what happened is after that point in time as a 15 year old, again, just kind of step by step, rung by rung, improving energy systems, like focusing on the mile, right. Mm. And getting that distance base and then focusing on the 500 and starting to pick up some speed, which was not, it was far from natural for me. <laughs> um, that then ultimately could help the 4 a.m. and bring home that last 50 and a 4 a.m. And I think it was a jigsaw kind of puzzle to put together while I still experienced life. I think one of the great things that Sergio kind of impressed upon me, that Rock Santos, who's, who's good buddies with Sergio, and they trained together. And they actually, funny, funny story, they, for a couple of summers in a row, they lived together in D.C. And they would train before the training group I was in. But they would drive me to practice um, in the summer. My parents would drop me off at their apartment and drive mm -hmm. me to practice. And I view things like that less swimming than, than personality. In other words, I was a big believer in who are we as, as competitors wired? Like, forget the water. Who are we, right? And to be around those guys, to see the intensity in which they practiced, but then had fun outside the pool to kind of balance life, I think was... I feel very fortunate to have been around that. Um, and I, I didn't take it for granted one minute of the day. And I don't still now, I think as an adult, I, there is a, a part of me that forever is thankful for Rock and Sergio and Mike because they, they were themselves. And I was able to watch that and go, I want to be, I want to be that. Right. Mm. And not, I want to be like time. The time is the only thing that matters, but I want to, I want to approach the sport that way, which is with ultimate intensity um, never letting down, never give it, letting, putting your guard down in practice and challenging, challenging yourself and others around you every minute of a workout. And, and it's funny how when you're little, you kind of almost like learn that through osmosis because you're not able to process it mentally at that age. So you just kind of think like, I guess that's what you do. Right. Yeah. And then you realize like, boy, what a unique opportunity that was to see that. Cause you mm -hmm. can hear stories and, and you know, this too, bro. like you can hear stories about great swimmers and, and how they train and what, but until you actually see how they carry themselves and how there just is no chink in the armor in terms of allowing themselves, allowing their, their brain to, to let down it all, to let that guard down and just, just push and push and push. Um, it's, it, I feel very fortunate that I had that, especially during those years, you know, as I started to figure out the sport and, and who I was going to be as an athlete. Yeah. Well, Sergio had a big influence on my life later, later in life when we coached together and, and I, you know, and I got to know him very well. So we always called him kind of like the Yoda of swimming that, you know, like yeah. a, the whisperer. So it was, it was nice to know that he was doing some whispering on, on Tom Dolan at a young age as well. So definitely, uh, he's, definitely. he's always had it, but so listen, you end up going to Michigan. There's a lot to talk about at Michigan. Um, why did you ultimately end up choosing that program? I mean, obviously it was one of the best decisions you've ever made. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. Um, easily one of the best decisions I've ever made yeah. for a lot of reasons. Yeah. But the quick backstory is I took recruiting trips to UCLA, Michigan, and Florida. Mm. My dad, um, who I love and is, 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 you know, kind of my role model in life. Um, he didn't want me to take five trips because he just thought it was a lot, um, you know, during a short period of time in the fall. And so we kind of whittled it down. 
Um, well, fast forward the, after my freshman year, UCLA men's program got caught. Um, so kind of fortuitous that I didn't, didn't choose Michigan. Um, I took a recruiting trip to Florida because at the time, the quick story um, uh, about Florida was that Chris Martin was the head coach there. And my first, my, I guess it was, yeah, it was my first national team trip. Um, I made Pam Pax in 93. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the, the summer after my uh, senior in high school. So before I started at Michigan, sure. I made Pam Pax um, and in the 4 a.m. Uh, and we were, uh, we were at training camp um, before the meet. And the meet was in, where was it? I think it was Kobe, Japan uh, back in 93. And my backstroke stunk back then. Um, and it's funny, Chris took one look at me in practice and – and Chris is a pretty tough coach. Like he kind of had that mindset of if you didn't do the work, he didn't really want to talk to you. Um, and he said, let me do one thing for you. And he gave me a pull boy, believe it or not. And like, it may sound crazy, but I had never used a pull boy in backstroke in my swimming career up to that point. And he said, I just want you to just do, just do like a 200, just easy pace with a pull boy. Let me see the difference. And I could feel it right away. All of a sudden, it was a shoulder-driven backstroke and got me up on top of the water, got my catch deeper underneath. And it kind of almost a byproduct developed this almost little gallop, which mm -hmm. is ultimately what my backstroke had, which ironically enough is exactly how Roy Sh Sharp swam backstroke. He was the American record holder in the tuner back, made the Olympics in 92 in Barcelona, um, he swam for Chris in high school at Petty up in New Jersey. Mm. Uh, and then Royce ended up in Michigan. So he was my teammate at Michigan. So I got to train backstroke with him there. And it was, it was amazing. As, as simple as that kind of concept, it, it forever put my backstroke on a different course than my former I am. To the point where, you know, I broke two minutes in the tuner back and it was kind of one of my events uh, for a while. Uh, made Pam Pax in it in 95 and, um, and I think metal, I'm not, I don't know if I meddled in it at 95 pay backs, but it, but anyway, it, it obviously, you know, dramatically improved my backstroke. So that's, that's why I look there. Um, you know, no offense to Florida and, and UCLA it was, all, it was one of the best decisions in my life. It was also one of the easiest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it didn't take very long me stepping foot um, on, on campus in Ann Arbor uh, to know it was the, the right fit. And, and we all know it, I think from a choosing, Choosing university is a big decision, but it's also a personality fit decision too. I mean, I think in fairness to all university coaches, and obviously nobody knows this better than you, it has to be a program fit to what you swim as well, right? Sure. There's a lot of different sides to it of like, okay, well, who's here and um, what do I swim and what is this coach known for coaching and all those elements come into it. Obviously, you know, you've got to feel at home there and, and those sorts of things and um, you know, I loved, I loved the experience of being there that weekend. I loved the importance of academics with athletics and balancing that out. You know, Urbanchek ha had a mid-distance uh, track record from, you know, tuner flyers, tuner freestyler, tuner backstrokers, 200 of strokers in general, up to distance freestylers and especially IMers. So it was kind of a perfect fit for my events. Um, but I also completely hit it off with him. Um, and, and I will tell you that uh, – this is all legal and was all totally fine. But one of the funny stories and, and kind of like, well, well, I'm definitely going here is John called me up before my trip and said, he said, Hey buddy, I've got to be careful with my impersonations by the way. Cause I've done a couple <laughs> podcasts where I've impersonated John and cussed. And I, and I totally, it's like an out of body experience. I didn't realize I cussed and I felt so bad if, if young swimmers are watching the podcast, like, Oh my God, Tom Dolan just cussed. And I felt so bad, but it's, it's like, that's how John talked to me. Um, so I promise I won't cuss, but right. he said, hey, buddy, uh, what do you want to do when you come here? And I was a huge, um, I mean, I'm a huge sports fan in general, but at the time, uh, the Fab Five was at Michigan. Mm. Um, and they, this, so my recruiting trip would have been the soft, their sophomore year. So Chris Weber, Howard, uh, Jalen Rose, Jimmy King, Ray Allen, they were in their second year there. And I had said, like, well, I don't know really what you're asking, John, but I'd love to meet Chris Weber. And, um, and he said, no problem, buddy. I'll call up Coach Fisher. We'll go have dinner. So one of the nights I was there, we went to dinner, just John and I, with Steve Fisher, um, who was a basketball coach and had, um, had, had been there for a while. Um, 
kind of had a reputation of his own as a, as a very good guy and Weber. And I mean, I just, it was like a moment, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh my God, this is crazy. And he actually was a, an awesome guy to me, stayed in touch even after he went to the NBA. When we went in two A's my sophomore year, like he, he sent a letter saying congrats and signed a Sports Illustrated for me, things like that. So it was a cool experience, but mm -hmm. more than anything, it was the, the, the connection that I had with John. I think there was a personality level where we really meshed well. And, you know, I think John, John is one of those coaches that um, I think all great coaches have this quality, which is, um, which is very difficult to come by. But it is not just coaching to the individual's needs and skill sets on a, on a high level team like that but connecting on a personality side to each of the different wiring of those athletes, mm. right? Which, which doesn't always happen. And it's, and that's hard to do. Um, and I think for us, we had a lot of, there was a lot of ego. There was a lot of testosterone. There was a lot of uh, kind of angst. Um, and I know you're going to talk to Gustavo and I think it'd be interesting to get his take because he's a super even keel guy. Mm. Um, and but we had a training group that, you know, especially the mid-distance IMers, it was not friendly. Mm. Um, and not in a team culture um, kind of virus way, but in a, hey, you know, kind of steel sharpens steel, iron sharpens iron. And mm. if you're going to come at me today, I'm going to come right back at you. And mm. kickboards flying and FUs and things like that. And it, and it was just the way of the world. Um, and it wasn't something that John shied away from. I think he, he sensed moments where he'd have to pull people into different groups. Mm. But it's also one of the reasons why in the 96 you know, games, we had so many guys from that team on the Olympic team. I mean, I think we had six Americans make, six American men make the, the U.S. team, wow. which is crazy. And That's then I crazy. think internationally, we had, a total, we had four more. Mm. Uh, so I think we had 10 in that pool make, make the Olympics in 96. And, and look, truth be told, you can't have, I mean, you know better than I, you can't have that without having some, some issues. I never viewed it as a problem, though. I loved it. Like, I, that's where I thrive. Like, I love the, I, I love the fire. You know what I mean? And, it's and, funny you uh, say that. Like, I, I actually texted Gustavo right before we got on. I said, I'm, I've got Tom Dolan on. What should I ask him? And the one question he said, he's like, um, ask him about the mental games that were played with the Michigan team in 95. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so, I mean, the, the thing that would happen and it happened to me too, is when you were a freshman coming in, this was a pretty kind of hefty machine in terms of what John had built. Right. And, and so as, as freshman 94 was my freshman year, you, you, you got, you got knocked down mm -hmm. and there were a lot of mental games played. There was a lot of, you know, you had to carry the luggage and this and that, which I didn't like, but, but I love that if you could make it through that, it 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 kind of did toughen you up and so it was and, like a, like a earn your spot type thing totally. was it okay yeah totally um and i think we took it as you know the freshman class i was in we took it as like yeah we'll do that and we'll out swim you right so it was almost this kind of competition within the team of yeah. like fine like screw you seniors like we'll swim faster than you then mm. right and but but again there is a line to toe, which I think John was, was really good at allowing that line to go out far enough yeah. that we could, we could kind of have that happen, but then pull it back to make sure that everyone understood we were still one, right? Yeah. Yeah. And 95 especially because I think that was the year where, you know, Albert, or, or, um, Stanford was, a, was just a, you know, kind of dominant force yeah. from the late 80s into the early 90s. Yeah. And so they were, they were a big rival of ours. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in 94, my freshman year, we got third. And I think Stanford won it that year. And then my sophomore year was kind of the perfect storm where um, Gus was a senior. And um, my class had a ton of uh, mid-distance freestyle guys, like 200 to 500 and some milers and 400 IMers. And that's really where we scored all our points, um, except for Gus and the sprints. But we, you know, I think we had five, I think we had six of the eight finalists in, in, in so in final three, 400 IM and mile, 
we had five of the eight finals in one of the events and six of the eight finals in the other. So we basically scored all mm. our points in that and winning the 800 for you. Um, and that was our whole group, you know, just training. And Gus is right, though. Like, it, there would be a lot of uh, – and, and John would do a lot of match races. So he would take me, for example, and say, go swim with the breaststrokers. Because he, he knew it was like a fox in the hen house of, like, I would just stir it up, you know. And – or, he, you know, he'd move people around just to kind of – you know, challenge. And, and it developed this environment of, man, if you can make it out of those workouts, go into a competition, it's just like practice, right? Because it was mm. all, it was all our guys. Um, and I think that there was, there was a constant battle, but it developed this kind of respect and camaraderie that toughened us up, really, so that come competition time, you know, it was kind of just an everyday thing, right? We were so used to it. Um, it was a very unique environment. And I think it was one that um, did change my, it certainly changed my mental makeup even more than, than what it had been coming in. Um, and also changed race strategies too, because you had all these different guys that kind of, some were better going out, some were better at bringing hunting. So it kind of forced you to kind of change your own strategy to manage who's around you and where they are at certain times and when you know to kind of hit the gas and when to hold off. And, um, and, and quite frankly, to John's credit, a lot of that was almost self-taught. Like, in other words, he knew exactly how to set us up so we'd learn from each other, right? Mm. And because there's no way he could do all of that. There's no way he could actually have all those conversations. And, and so he set a lot of that up so we learned from each other. And it was... Um, you know, it was obviously a unique time in my career. And, and uh, the biggest thing, too, I would say about John is, to his credit, really wasn't what he was paid for. He had no problem saying to us, um, world championships and the Olympics are more important than NC2A. And that's a hard thing to say, right? I mean, that's what, that's what his job is, is for NC2A, right? And, but he always had that perspective, which I thought helped all of us to say – it's not to literally say nobody cares about our conference meeting and series, but but I think it's also like he did a great job of of helping us focus big picture and that these are all stepping stones, right? Mm. And not to fall completely in love with one or the other and know that there's always something more out there. Um, yeah, which I think was was you know enormously impactful on not just me, all of us. Here's a tough question. I, I, I was thinking of making it easier, but I'm going to make it tough. All right. Um, so you're in a group like this and you're in a team that is incredible and you've got all these guys around you, these Olympians. And like you said, six of them made the U S team, four of them swam at other countries. You've got 10 guys. Why is it you think, and I, I don't want you to, I don't want you to, you know, crap on your teammates, but why is it that Tom Dolan ended up the top dog? Why did you end up the guy the Olympic champion, the double Olympic champ. Why, why do you think, was it talent? Was it, was it your work ethic? Was it a combination of the two? Like, why is it that you ended up on top? Yeah, look, I think it's a great question. And I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's not one that is lost on me in terms of a thought process. Right. I think that, um, I, I would, I would answer it a couple different ways. Here's the first story that, that can provide part of the answer. Um, I can't truthfully remember when I started doing this, but for most of my career, one of the things that I would do um, consistently every practice, it didn't matter whether it was, you know, right before a big meet or almost in the off season, the, the, the end of every practice in the warm, uh, um, when we we're finishing our warm down, the last length of every practice. And again, this is like from when I was a little kid, I don't remember what age, but all the way through up my through the Olympics, um, I would do the same thing, and that is um, the last length of warm down. Um, I would flip the switch, going really slow, like doing warm down, but mentally flip the switch and put myself in an Olympic final, um, the last length of mm. my race, mm. and to the point where like I could almost every day make my the hair on my arm stand up and on the back of my neck stand up like that's how much I could kind of put myself in that moment mm. it wouldn't change how I was swimming in other words it was still warm down mm. but it was just a sensory exercise of hearing the crowds seeing where competitors are and then ultimately strokes into the wall just visualizing me putting my hand on the wall first and I did it uh, every practice 
every day of my career. Mm. Um, and I share that just because I don't tell that story a ton, but um, I'm not saying that like every swimmer out there should do that now forever. What I am saying is w that we are all different people um, and we, we all have different beliefs and different uh, muscle makeup and different skills and weaknesses. Um, but there is one common factor that we all have, which is our brains are way more powerful than we give them credit, mm. right? And I always believed as a young kid all the way through the Olympics that no matter how I felt physically, taper gone wrong. I mean, I'm definitely one of those guys that was like, I mean, I, I just didn't believe in taper in the sense of the, the, the physical reality taper, totally believed in because I trained a ton of yardage. But to me, having a great meet is not about did you feel perfect it's about making it happen right and i think all of us that got to that level would agree we can probably count on one hand the number of races that just felt perfect and you didn't tighten up and you did right and it just it doesn't that's actually not the the reality for for any of us right and and so that's the first thing i would do is i would put myself in that moment where it was not about the time it was about that sensation of getting to the wall first and it was so normal for me because i did it to finish every single practice to get out of the pool mm. and that and i didn't tell anybody about it i didn't make a big deal about it it's just what i did mm. and i think that would lead me to this kind of uh mindset um maybe maybe it was because of when i was 15 and talked to sergio maybe it was because i got to be around you know incredible uh workers and more importantly incredible people like Sergio and Rock and Mike and I just was fortunate to see that maybe it, I just was a kid that like I, I used to read a ton about Jordan and magic just to give you a, another example mm. and I was fascinated and I mean it was the same era it was like what so so what made Michael Jordan so great and it's not that magic Johnson wasn't great because he was I mean ultimately one of the best basketball players ever in history but boy were they different human beings mm. right and why was it that everybody loved magic and was scared of Jordan, right? Mm. Like I was obsessed with that as a little kid mm. and I loved it. I loved, I loved that, that reality and that study. And I'm not saying one's better than the other, just is, it is what it is, yeah. right? And I, yeah. loved, I loved analyzing that. And I loved the fact that Jordan leveraged fear, loved it. Thought it was, that I, I totally could relate to it. And again, we're swimmers, I get it, we're not boxers, but, but you know, we're not like UFC people. But like there is a mentality um, that I think is very different. And it is, it, I can only talk about myself. I'm not knocking anybody else. I'm just telling you that when I would, my favorite place in the world was a ready room at the Olympics, at World Championships, at n at any meet, mm. my favorite place in the world. Why? Because I could look everybody in, in the eye and I knew they had no chance, none. <laughs> and, and I just say that from a standpoint of like, that's, who I was. Oh, I love I, it. I love it that you said it. It's brilliant. And, and I could look around and go, that guy's out. He can't even look me back. Mm. Or like that guy's looking back at me, but like, he's not really, he's like waiting to look away. Mm. And I could, I could just sit there for, for minutes on end and stare at someone and just wait until they looked away. And I knew like they're out, they're out, they're out. So by the time we walked out there, maybe there was one or two guys that was actually in it. And I just share that because, again, that's not a story I tell often because I don't think it – I get it. Like, I, I'm a real person. I, it probably doesn't sound great. Um, no, no. It, it, sounds, um, it sounds real to me, 100% real. Because I think, look, not everybody, even the best of the best of the best, and I was one of the best of the best of the best, I was not – I was not born to be an Olympic champion. You know, I think, I think to be an Olympic champion, there is another line that separates you from everybody else. And this, what you're talking about right now is what separated you from me because I didn't have that skill where I could walk into the ready room and just cut people down before we raced and knew that, yeah. all right, I've only got to beat one guy. For me, it was yeah. like, I was, I was panicked in the ready room. I'm like, yeah. oh, there's yeah. Alexander Popoff. There's yeah. Peter Van and Hoogenband. You know, like for me, it was like, holy hell. Yeah. I was the guy that you were staring at and thinking, shit, I can't <laughs> beat him, you know? So, so yeah, I think you're special in that sense, for sure. Uh, I think you had a gift to say that you had this killer instinct and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's a good thing to embrace, you know? Here's the other way I would, I would frame it too, is, you know, how every, you hear every, every elite level swimmer say, for the most part, 
in, in the U.S. say the most pressure packed meet for them is the Olympic trials, yeah. right? They feel like, man, when I get to the Olympics, it's pressure's off. I'll say this. I, I, don't, I think everybody need, should and needs to have their own opinion and experiences. I can only speak for mine. My, my favorite meets in the world were the Olympic trials I, because I didn't – was the air thicker? Yeah, sure. Like, it should be. You're f- trying to make the freaking Olympic team. If it's not thicker, something's wrong, yeah. right? But I loved it. Like, I, I, I felt – I didn't feel great, really, like, race preparedness-wise at, at Olympic trials. But, boy, I, I won all the time because – it was, it was awesome. Like, that's what we train for. We train to get tested by the best. That was like a birthday party for me mm-hmm. mentally, right? I'm like, why else did I just go through this nightmare of dealing with asthma and things going wrong? And like, why did I go through that if I can't enjoy uh, the, the competition and seeing my buddies from around the country and, uh, and, and stepping up and, and accepting their challenge, right? And and, and I mean, that's to me, like that was the joy of the sport um, at that time. Right. And I think, I think that's why I fell so much in love with the process because it was freaking hard. And so if I didn't enjoy those moments of staring people down and, and loving, just loving the, the grind, loving that fire, I don't think I could have done it because it, again, like with asthma and everything, it was too hard. Like mm. I had to have found joy in that to make it all worthwhile to then start over and do it all again for a year, two years, three years, four years. Um, and so, so for me, like the Olympic trials again was a, it was this, this celebration of this is what you deserve. Right. And, and, and yeah, we should all feel like it's pressure because that lets you know you're alive and you're respecting the process and respecting your competitors. Right. But you know, the, one of the great life lessons for me was how do you turn that juice right into a positive uh, and, and swim faster because of it, yeah. not endure it and still try to have a good swim. But literally that's the reason that you swim well. Mm. And that's what I feel like I worked the most on is uh, taking that tense environment prep and, and having it be the reason that you succeed. And you're thankful for it, right? And and you know, I I use it like in in dad in dad world of anyone that loves to play golf. And I'm still the same way. My favorite time playing golf is when I'm playing in uh, you know like a friend's tournament or something, and people are watching. Like automatically, I will play better. Like hands down, the more people that watch, mm. the better I will play. Whereas when no one's around, it's like, oh, I don't know, you know, you hit it around and you're not as yeah. focused. That's kind of my dad, like analogy to mm. my mindset back then. And, 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 I, and I didn't apologize for it because it was how I learned to be wired, right? And I'll tell you a quick story about when I was, how far back this goes. Um, and this is kind of a Homer story in that it deals with the Washington Redskins, the NFL team here. Um, but it's more the point, I think, from a swimming standpoint, um, I was, I think I was, uh, either nine or 10 and I was swimming in a summer league meet and my dad was in the stands. Um, my dad knows nothing about swimming, like mm-hmm. to the point where in 94 in Rome, when I broke the world record, my dad had no idea it was the world record, except that um, Roy Sharp's dad said, no, 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 look up at the scoreboard. And it said world record flashing. Otherwise my dad would have just been like, good race, son. <laughs> right. And which is awesome, by the way, Lo- yeah. like yeah, one of the great, great- parenting tricks of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, but my dad uh, is a lawyer. And back then, this is in the, in the 80s, my dad did a lot of the contracts for, um, the Washington, for some of the Washington Redskins players. Um, and the offensive line for the Redskins back then was called the Hogs. Pretty famous. They won a bunch of Super Bowls. And so one of the guys, his name was Russ Grimm, who ended up being a, a coach in the NFL for, for a long time after he played. And so He's, so Russ had called him up and said, hey, you know, I'm hearing through the grapevine, your son's a pretty good little swimmer. Can I come watch him swim? And my dad was like, Russ, why do you, why do you want to watch him swim? Like, what do you care about something? He's like, no, 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 I just love, I love watching, you know, athletes no matter what age. So, there's, so the two of them are in the stands. And I think it was a 50 breaststroke. Um, I won by like a half a pool length. Um, and back then, like nobody's going to understand this, but back then, you'll remember this, like the parents are timing, okay? Yeah. We had no touch pad system. Like yeah. they're literally just – like hitting the hitting the timer. Uh-huh. So I, I asked the parents what was my time. 
and they told me the time and I had had a goal to break the pool record by a certain amount of time. And I broke the pool record one by half pool length, but I didn't go the time I wanted. And I ripped my goggles and cap off and threw them against the wall, which makes me cringe now as a father because I would race down and grab mm. my kid mm. if, if any of my boys or girls did that, which was my dad's first physical reaction was he, he kind of lurched up. And Russ just grabbed his shoulder and said, no, 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 sit down for a second. Like, let's just watch what happens. And my dad's going like, you know, kind of screw you. This is my son. He's, he's making an ass of our family name here. And he's yeah. not respecting. And Russ said, I get that. I, I can see it too. But, but he said, let's just watch what happens. And so Russ didn't know anything about swimming. So he didn't know about meat records, any of that. And my dad, my dad still tells this story to this day. So get out of the pool. Everyone's done this and that. Um, they hear through the coaches. Why was Tom so upset? Well, he had a goal time of however much below the, the meet record and that, or the pool record, and that's what he was shooting for. And he didn't get that even though he got the other stuff. And Russ just kind of shook his head. And my dad was like, that's bullshit. Like, you don't act like that. I don't care yeah. what the reason. Yeah. And Russ goes, no, no, no. You don't get it. That's not normal. And my dad's like, no, you're, you're right. It's not normal. He's got to be a better behaved kid. And Russ is like, no, no, no. That's not about behavior. That, he is wired a different way. And he's saying, I'm telling you right now, I play in the NFL. I'm on a team that's won a Super Bowl championship. I bet you we don't have three guys like that have that mentality. Mm -hmm. They just are happy to be there. And are yeah. they great athletes? Absolutely. Do they work hard? No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. But they are just happy to be there. And, and if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And, and he said to my dad, he goes, you don't understand. The biggest challenge for this kid is figuring out how he can – take that anger and that energy and that frustration and use it for good. And yeah. it's a story my dad still tells because from a, from a parenting standpoint, it was kind of one of those aha moments of like, boy, how do I parent that? Right. Yeah. And he's super thankful because his fear now would have been if he had gone down and kind of ripped me a new one that maybe I wouldn't have ever thought that way again. Right. Yeah. I would think that was wrong. And so my big takeaway even now as a parent is, you know, how do we manage that and find that? But, but I think that's who I was, right? And I think the, the key back to Olympic trials and the ready room is that I was wired a certain way that um, for good or for bad, like I, I never was happy to be there. I yeah. never totally just said, hey, isn't this great? Because there was always another goal, right? There was always something next in line. And it's not that I wasn't appreciative of the Olympics or Olympic trials and being on that stage, but that if, if you're going to separate yourself back to your question, the way I did it is there was always something more and there was only really one good outcome of it. And truth be told, Brett, I, I would say that, look, I don't have regrets in my swimming career and I think nobody should, right? Because we work hard and whatever, whatever happens is meant to be in whatever life skill setting that happens. Um, but I will say this, one of the things that, um, that strikes me now looking back is I for sure had the mentality that if it wasn't a gold medal, that it, it did, it, nothing existed. Um, and, and, and I don't, I don't believe that for society, right? Like I, I like, I think, you know, media coverage in the U S is such that like if the Americans don't win the gold medal and they win a silver and bronze, that like they rarely even show them on can It's crazy. Yeah. I don't believe that as like a philosophical, but that's kind of how I was wired. And, Part of me, I don't want to go back and change it, but wishes I was more appreciative of good swims that didn't ultimately end up as gold medals, right? But it's just how I was, it's who I was, was that it was that or nothing. Yeah. Um, and I think it framed a lot of my races that way. Yeah. Well, that kind of brings me to a story I think it's appropriate to bring up now. I mean, obviously you win in 96, you win the gold, which is great, but then you go on to, to Sydney in 2000 and you're attempting to defend, which uh, I talked to Alex Popoff the other day and he said defending was 10 times harder than trying, you know, yeah. it wasn't two times harder. It was like 10 times harder. Yeah. So I'd imagine yeah. it was the same for you, right? So, yeah. so I'm on the Australian team in 2000. You're on the US team. We have this incredible night one. You know, Ian Thorpe wins the 400 free, the men our men beat the U.S. by a touch yep. and, and win the 400 um, freestyle relay. Uh, I'm sure there were some other events. Anyway, we had a great first day. And yep. so from my memory, your 400 IM was day two. 
Yes. And correct. and there was a story that went around. I don't know how accurate this is. This, this is where <laughs> you need to fill me in. Okay. There was a story that went around, and and I heard through the grapevine that uh, you went back to the village, and you were so pissed off and so fired up that you you're in. I think you were in one of the rooms. And, and again, this is a story. But apparently, you picked up a chair. Like some some of the U.S. guys were in the room, and you picked up a chair and you threw it through the window, and you were like. We're gonna fucking kill those guys tomorrow, <laughs> and, and and so the story is you were super fired up yeah. after after night one, and yeah. you come out night two and just destroy the field in the four hundred IM. Is that an accurate story, or was that just a rumor? Uh, yeah. So I, I'll say this: the emotion of that story is one hundred percent accurate. A few of the details are different. Okay. In essence, it is accurate. I I I was in the village shaving with oh. Eric Vent. Who, Eric Bent was that he got the silver medal in the 4 IM yeah. um, in that in, in Sydney, and so we we weren't actually there. We were watching it on TV. Okay. Uh, pretty much everything else is is correct though, and I was furious. And to be look to be clear, it it, it was um, my view is is always I think um, probably different than the perception of it. Um, it's funny that was maybe one of the best nights that could have happened to me to focus me for the next day of swimming. Mm. Um, but I would also take that story back a bit in time um, in that, you know, when we, when we arrived in Australia to prep for the games, um, that's really more of when that started to build because, you know, our, our team talked a lot about how, um, swimming is is the is it in Australia, mm -hmm. and we I love that. So I love that it was like I always used to say like to our team, it's like it's like our upside down sport culture, and that nobody cared about the dream team, and and that's not literally, but you know what I mean. Like yeah. people cared more about the swimmers than the freaking dream team, which was my dream. Like it was like the reverse world for us yeah. of what we're used to at the bottom rung as swimmers. You know, we've got. Uh, NBA players and you know NFL players and and but it, like we go down there and all of a sudden it's that's the focus point is swimming and um, and and not to get off topic but like to prove the point for those watching how much this is true I mean you know it because you lived it in there and that's your culture but it's so much so true that when I got done swimming um, I remember swimming had ended but I was still there the second week I'll never forget I got into a taxi cab in the city in sydney mm. and the cab driver looked in the in the rear view mirror like through the plexiglass that separates the car and recognized me which first of all that alone would never happen in the u.s um and the guy not only recognized me he said to me i'll never forget i was like what am i on like the hidden camera here <laughs> he said um how did you split and he gave the number which i don't even remember the number of my first 50 of breaststroke split in my eye am. and he's like that was the split that just did everyone in and i'm like Holy <laughs> shit, like where am i right now like i i just kept expecting someone to like jump in the window and go ha, ah, you're on camera like this guy was totally into it yeah and, and he was australian yeah. like it's not like he was american you know he was just appreciative of sport right yeah. which is what i i you know further came to find i think that's what's awesome about australians is sure like everybody has pride in their country right but there's also a respect for sport mm. um and i think that would be one of the, the greatest things I, I could teach anybody about kind of competing in australia so it's it's interesting because go back in time like this was the build-up of you know the the whole staff telling us like look nobody's going to be rooting for you um this is you know this is the home of swimming and it's a, it's a huge sport there. There's going to be 20,000 people. It'll be sold out. It's the most people that have ever watched a swimming meet. Um, and I remember in team meetings, I'd stand up and go, I don't get it. W why are we framing it that way? Mm -hmm. This is the greatest opportunity we've ever had in our lives because I'm wired where if we, if our sport was like, you know, a stadium sport, I would want a road game every single time for my meet mm -hmm. because I love, I love knowing that they're not cheering for me. Like, mm. that's just who I am. Mm. You know, like, I love that challenge. I think I'm just a challenge seeker in general. Mm. Like, I love, if somebody tells me I can't do it, oh, my God, it's like the greatest fuel I've ever received. And it kind of goes back to our asthma talk. Like, I, I think 
as much as that's a challenge, it's like, great, like, let's have at it, you know, and, and, and like, say I can't do it. And that gives me so much motivation. And so, so I love the atmosphere, right? So in a weird way, what you guys did on the first night, I, I actually kind of loved, yeah. right? Yeah. But it came out in the form of me saying, look, this is a perfect time to motivate everyone to go F this mm -hmm. time to turn things around. Let's yeah. turn the tide. And that's part of the, the story is we were shaving and Vince watching it. This is his first Olympics. He's a young guy. Um, and he's like, oh, like, uh, like when you guys won the 400 free relay, he was like, Holy shit. Mm. like, man, like the momentum is, and I, and that's when I, that's when I threw stuff. I, yeah. I won't get into what I threw, but I go, <laughs> yeah, like th that it's time to step up and turn this around. Yeah. And I said to him, we're going to go one, two tomorrow night. I guarantee you, I think they could cut my arm off and we're going to go one, two end of story. And so it's funny because where I thought you were also going to go with the story is that you know, my reaction was, was pretty aggressive and strong after that race. Um, and, and to the point where my kids are young, I have four kids, but they're, they're, so they're six, five, three, and two. Mm. And, but my six year old is like just now old enough to kind of maybe get a little bit of it mm. and, and kind of understand like, that's like, who's my dad and that sort of thing. And, um, so my wife showed the 4am race from Sydney and my daughter loved it. But it's funny, like her first comment was she kind of like sat for a second after it ended and, and they showed me like going like this and, mm -hmm. and she's like, dad, are you mad or happy? Like, <laughs> you be happy? And I thought it was such a great, like, just a great way to kind of view it. And, and so typical, of you know, a six-year-old kid to kind of, and I said, I'm, I'm happy. But I said, I also felt like I needed to play a role that showed my teammates it's possible. Like it's possible to swim well, even if everyone's not cheering for you. Right. And I think athletes sometimes have this mentality of like, Oh, everybody's against me and that's going to affect how I swim. Right. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, we all grew up in a sport where this is your property, right? Like there's no fans in your lane. They're not, they can't like push the water against you to have mm -hmm. the weight go against you. Like you have the ability way more than they do to change the whole atmosphere of that facility. And I love that. I love that on an institute a level. Um, I mean, I thought you guys, I thought Marsh and you guys, like after I was done at Michigan, thankfully, you guys were masters of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like changing that yeah. emotional level. I think it's harder on an international stage to do it. Um, I think it's easier, quite frankly, in college because you live together, you're together every day. But that was part of my motivation was, sure, I wanted to get one too, but I wanted to change that momentum for our team so that there's a belief system to say, it doesn't matter where we are. It's still, I mean, it's, I'm pretty sure they didn't change the distance of the pool. It's still in your lane. Still, and, and, it, and, and as you know, it works, right? That works in our sport. There is an emotional wave that can happen that all of a sudden, the most elite of swimmers who question themselves a little bit are like, boom. And then it's just, and then it's just a chain reaction and it can go right down the line of all of a sudden, everyone believes in themselves. And maybe all of a sudden they do go to the ready room and look around and go, you're out, you're out. You know what I mean? And I think, yeah. so it's, it's funny, like I, it is, it is true. Um, it certainly was not, you know, bad intention toward you guys. It's just that, that it's that emotional momentum, right. That, that I just felt was important to kind of turn the tide. So it didn't get away from us, which it could have pretty easily. Well, it sounds very Phelps like it. It's, it's clear that you had a huge impact on Michael Phelps and, um, you know, just the way that you, describe your own mentality and your own um, ability to pull the best out of yourself and then your reactions. You know, I've, I've seen Michael on camera and I've also seen Michael off camera and, it, and a lot of what you're talking about, you, you probably had a huge influence on, on Michael Phelps's career, no doubt in my mind. You know, I think that one of the things I would say, and I think this is totally true, having not lived it on the Australian team, but I think it is true with you guys too, Certainly true with the American team. And it's one of the things that I, I probably love most about the sport, which is um, there's no such thing as being selfish. Mm. And by that, what I really mean is, look, somebody's always going to come up and be faster. It's just the way the world works. Mm. I mean, you know, you and I are the same generation. Alexander Popoff was like mm. from a different planet, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> yeah, I didn't but, either. Right? Yeah. But then – Somebody comes along, right? And other sprinters come along. Like Kieran Perkins to me was 
Mm. I'm not sure what was inside of his skin. Like, what was it metal part? Like, I don't know, right? Mm. But, but, I, but I was always one that, like, I didn't think it was too bad or that, like, oh, I wish he was American. I never thought that. I just thought, like, how great is that for the sport, right? Because you can see what's possible. It shows you what's possible. And there is no limit to that kind of human ambition when it comes to sport. And so my point is, like, I think – what the, what the American team has done so well through the decades and through generations is, is one, understanding to its core and accepting that others must and need come up after you. And they may be better than you. They may break your record. They may, whatever it may be. But, but that part of our, uh, our accepted role in this is to teach them, mm -hmm. is to show them a way. And we all do it differently, right? Um, some people don't run their mouths as much as I do, right? So some people are more inward and so they just show it, but it, it's not right or wrong. It's everyone has to find their own way. Yeah. And that's one of the great lessons I learned really early on on the national team was um, the pride in which you should carry yourself to help the younger swimmers to understand kind of what is this landscape, right? And how does this work? And um, how should you race? And, um, you know, what, what, what this world is all about. And, and, and as you know, it, 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 it's not just a learned thing in one year. You've got to experience that to really learn how to master those moments and leverage them to your, kind of to your ability, whether they work really well or not, whether you miss the bus at World Championships or the, or the village, you know, it's just part of it. And how do you then maintain control of that and leverage that properly? And I certainly, I, you know, look, Michael's in his own, talk about, I mean, in his own stratosphere. Yeah. Um, but I, but I do think that what I, what I took very, uh, very much to heart because I benefited greatly from it, from those that came before me, mm -hmm. was um, passing down mindsets yeah. and, and kind of um, perspectives um, at, a, at an elite level in competition and at meets of preparation and, um, and, and just kind of ways that, that I looked at things um, and what drove me. Um, and I tried to do it in a way that wasn't so kind of like talking over everybody, but just saying, look, w why would we need to frame it that way? Why wouldn't we say this is the, the greatest motivation that we could ever have, right? Mm -hmm. And why wouldn't we, we choose that as our leverage point rather than like, let's see if we can make it through this, which again, I think is back to that mindset of sure, you're not being disrespectful to the Olympic Games or World Championships or anything else by, by not saying like how appreciative you are to be there, but you don't just have to be there. What, like you trained all this time just to go are you kidding me but well, what's the point like take away strip all that stuff down strip away the village strip away the stadium like just give me the pool then because I didn't train four years and go through hell and high water to just be happy to be there I, I trained so I would win right mm. I touched the wall at the end of every practice in my mind to win so what none of the none of the rest of it matters at all and that's how I viewed Olympic Charles that's a and so I think like my hope always was I could return the favor of what was provided for mm. me. Right. And, and being able to kind of pass that torch down, so to speak. And, um, and I think it's hard, right. It's hard on, on any uh, international team like that. Cause you've got a lot of people, you got a lot of personalities and everybody kind of views it differently. And so you want to make sure you're not just squashing how others may want to go about it. Cause everybody's different. Right. And everybody is wired differently. And, and sees things differently. Yeah. Well, it's a big reason why I started this podcast because I love chatting. I love sharing information and um, you've definitely shared a lot about yourself and your personality and the reasons why you got there. And, and look, you know, at the start of this, before we came on camera, I asked you, let's talk about, you know, some sets some some workouts that you did. And to me, it's like, it's it's really not about that you know like to me it's more about your mentality and the way that you approach your life every day and just you talking about visualizing yourself winning at the end of every workout to me that that's enough you know that that's incredible that's the lesson that people need to take away is that you were just doing little things to prepare yourself to be a champion every single day and it wasn't the x's and o's necessarily even though you had a band check who's one of the best coaches in history for sure no doubt but um it's the, it's the other things that you were doing that separated you. So listen, man, I really appreciate your time. We've, we've gone a little longer than I expected, but um, it was so worth it, you know? So thank you. I'm, I'm very appreciative. My pleasure. And, uh, and thank you, Brett. I mean, I think, um, you know, you're a dad, I'm a dad. 
I don't have a, I don't have a lot of space to, to be able to kind of share that stuff and, and, yeah. and even just revisit it and talk yeah. about it. Um, yeah. So I, I love it just as much as you do um, being on the other side. So, I mean, I, I appreciate you, uh, your willingness to have me on and, and chat about it. Yeah, oh man, I had a lot of people reach out to me and be like, you got to get Tom Dolan. You got to get, Tom. I was like, yeah, I, I do. You're right. I got to get him. So I'm, I'm, thank you. Thanks for answering my text and um, appreciate it. But listen, good luck with the swim school. I know you've thank been you. running that for many years. I know that um, there's some challenges ahead with, with, with any business, any small business, yeah. but especially schools right now, swim, swim school. So um, good luck with that. And hopefully uh, we, can, we can come back and chat again. All right. Sounds good. I'd lo love, to, love to be on anytime you need me. Just uh, shoot me a text. All right, Tom Dolan. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Thanks, Brett. Take care. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody.